Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison, or the grave. This time, everything that happened from the orange-haired man with a map past the oaf with a pitchfork to the body at the covered bridge was wrong. Dead wrong. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Covered Bridge. You know, every once in a while, into the life of one Philip Marlowe, a little peace and quiet must fall. A day marked by neither murder nor mayhem. No phone calls, just nothing. I was just beginning to like it, too, when the door opened and a head full of slick orange hair walked in. It was on a man wearing a new flannel suit, a hand-painted tie, and a reckless grin. He shoved the telephone out of his way, sat down on the corner of my desk, and sized me up with a pair of careful gray eyes. Got a proposition for you, laddie. Tell me about it. Let you know if I'm interested. You should be. There's good money in it. It's not always the answer. Go ahead. You got a good car? Good enough. I don't keep it in the office. You like Mexico? Look, is this a social call or a quiz program? Well, this is business. I asked you a question. Yeah, I like Mexico. I don't like you. Well, that's good, because you're going to drive a couple of friends of me down there. Uh, name your price. Not interested. A thousand bucks? Not interested. That's too bad. Would have been nicer to work this out without a gun. Listen, you two-bit jerk. Talk easy, laddie. This gun is bigger than both of us. Now, you're going to drive across the Mexican border tonight with three passengers. And there won't be any difficult questions. Because you are the well-known Senor Philip Marlowe, a respectable private detective. Somewhere below the border, your fellow travelers will catch a boat. But this, you don't have to worry about. Now, look, just a minute. Look, laddie, I came to you for several reasons. One of which is that you're smart enough to know when to quit fighting the problem. We gotta make a stop first, so let's go. Uh, and leave your artillery in the drawer. Come on. Yeah, sure. Since I'm now an old pal of yours, what do I call you? You pick it. Believe me, you won't like it. Um, how about George? You like George? Not particularly. Good. Just call me George. Let's go, Marlo. <laughs> We nodded at the elevator girl, waved goodbye to the kid in the parking lot, and headed south on Highway 101. All with the front of that Mauser nudging my kidney. It was screwy, but I was on my way to Mexico. Uh, Don't get ambitious, Marlowe. Not too fast, not too slow. Just keep it rolling nice and steady. I did what I was told and watched for a break. For every foot of a hundred miles down the coast. At Oceanside, we cut inland past Escondido and up into the citrus country. Once he dug a little map from his pocket and studied it while we headed into the hills where farms were farther apart. George was busy looking for a turnoff when my chance came, and it came fast. My foot slammed down hard on the brakes. George's head split the windshield, and the gun slipped out of his hand. I dropped two wheels in the ditch, but I got the gun. He took one look, then jumped out and ran in a low crouch for the back of the car. Before I could follow him, I heard the truck coming. It was a big two-section job rolling fast. It topped the rise just as George pivoted toward the road. The truck driver must have seen him just as he hit him, as the air brakes locked on all 26 wheels at the same time. I ran to where George lay like a discarded doll at the side of the road. The truck driver was out of his cab before it stopped rolling. I didn't see him. I didn't see him. I come over the rise there. I, I didn't see him. Take it easy. Honest, I didn't see him. Is, is he all right? He ain't dead, is he? No, no, he isn't. He won't be walking much anymore. It wasn't my fault, Mr. Honest. I know it wasn't. Get hold of yourself. Uh, Gosh, what should we do? I want you to drive to the nearest phone and get the police and then come back. Here's my card. Give it to the troopers. Tell them they can reach me at my office. Yeah, what are you going to do? I can figure out how to read this map of his. I'm going to pay a call on a couple of people who are expecting this guy. Maybe it's just a stubborn streak, but when I'm being used as a patsy, I like to meet the people involved. As I drove, I studied the map and... Two miles down the highway, I found the first landmark, a dead tree. There I left the highway and followed a rocky trail seven corkscrew miles up a canyon to the next landmark, a bridge. 
one that looked like it had been lifted out of some rustic Connecticut woods and dropped across the California gorge purely by mistake because it was covered complete to roof and walls and made entirely of lumber. And on the hill beyond was a lonely house where the trail marked on the map ended. I drove slowly through the sagging wood tunnel and at the other end deliberately killed my motor. And I got out, raised the hood, and went to work on the distributor. I don't know where he came from, but when I glanced up, he was standing there watching me. A bull in overalls with a pitchfork clenched in a pair of hands as thick as $4 steaks. We didn't like each other's looks. You picked a bad place for trouble, mister. That's so. Why? Nobody almost never comes up this road, especially strangers. How come you took it? Really want to know, or you're just killing time? I wouldn't be too smart if I was you, mister. Uh, You live in that house up there? No, not anymore. I got canned for drinking. Why are you so interested in that place? The only farm around here. Maybe they got a mechanic. Yeah, maybe. Where'd you say you were from? L.A. Uh, Los Angeles, huh? You real sure you don't know anybody up there on the hill? Like who, for instance? A certain party who took a trip to L.A. not so long ago. And another thing, city boy. Don't get out of line or I'll fix you good. Understand? Yes? Oh, yes. Now, I mean, how do you do? <laughs> you want something? Uh, yes, my car stalled at the bottom of the hill. Dolly! Dolly, who is it? Who's there? Uh, a man, Uncle Walter. He says his car broke down. What's that? Your, your car broke down, you say? Yeah, I don't know what went wrong, Mr. Uh... My name is Brule, Walter Brule. Oh, I'm glad to know you. I'm Philip Marlowe. What are you doing on this road, Mr. Marlowe? I thought it was a shortcut. Did you? Well, you were wrong. It's a dead end. Oh. Mm, come inside. Thanks. Look, Mr. Brule, I'd like to have somebody who knows motors come down and look at my car, huh? Mm-hmm. All right, then Ed comes in. I guess he could go down with you. Oh, I... That's I, my I, new hired hand, Ed Fry. Oh. I don't know, Uncle Walter. It's getting pretty dark. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing myself. As a matter of fact, if you can accommodate me, Mr. Brule, I'd just as soon rest up a while and shove off in the morning. I want to pay you for everything, of course. Stay overnight? Oh, I, uh, I'm afraid that's impossible. We... Impossible? Don't... Why? What's the matter with you, Dolly? If necessary, I'm sure we can arrange to take care of Mr. Marlowe some way. Well, okay. Yeah, that's better. Now, if you want me, Dolly, I'll be out in the barn. Make yourself comfortable, Mr. Marlowe. Your uncle, huh? He owns this place? That's right. My mother was his favorite sister. Oh. Uh. You want a cup of coffee? Oh, I'd love it. Haven't had any farm kitchen coffee in ages. You, uh, you don't seem to have many visitors up this way, Dolly, huh? No, not many. Nice farm, though. Stinks. Is that why you run off to L.A. now and then? How did you know about that? I guessed. I ran into a friend of yours at the bottom of the hill. A pair of overgrown shoulders with a pitchfork. Said he used to work here. <laughs> Him. He did up until a month ago. That's Noah Bickman. Big dumb goof. Here's your cup. No, oh, thanks. By the way, Mr. Marlowe, where are you heading? Oh, Mexico, maybe. Mexico? Yeah. You kind of came a long ways out of your way, didn't you? Did I? Dolly! Dolly! We're in here, Eddie. What's the matter? A car at the bottom of the hill. Whose is it? The car belongs to me. It's stalled. Uh, who are you? This is Mr. Marlowe, Eddie. He's uh, on his way to Mexico. Wow, well, you don't say. And since his car broke down so late, he... May stay all night. Uncle Walter said it'd be all right. Is that a fact? I'll uh, go get some blankets, Eddie, so you can take them up to the spare room for Mr. Marlowe. Oh, okay, Dolly. Mr. Marlowe, huh? Where are you from, Mr. Marlowe? L.A. You? Uh, points east. You know, this road don't go to Mexico, Marlowe. In fact, it stops about a mile up the draw here. 
Kind of funny that you wound up on it, isn't it? I don't see you breaking up over it, Eddie. Don't let my poker face throw you, pal. Traveling alone, are you? I am now. Meaning what? That there's nobody with me. That's simple, isn't it? Not in my book, pal. I might even want you to draw me a picture of that one. Here's the blankets, Eddie. Sheet and pillowcase. Oh, okay, okay, it's fine. Come on upstairs, Marlowe. I'll show you the room. You want me to go with you and make the bed? No, you stay here and put up some more coffee, Dolly. All right. Got a hunch I may want lots of it tonight. Let's go, Marlo. Right behind you, Eddie. How's the weather been in L.A.? Some might call it hot. Uh-huh. Yeah, get the door, will you? Sure. Uh. Okay, how come it's you, pal? I got good credentials, a car, and a tight yap. You better be right on all three. How'd you find me? Little map, Eddie. From Escondido to the dead tree to the covered bridge, and then up here it's a cinch. Why'd you show alone? Where's Red? Gotta meet us at the border. That's a bum fit, pal. It's not in the book. Why? Uh, he had some kind of a last-minute jam with the boat. Oh, that jerk. He's had a month to line this up while I've been holed up out here in the sticks, making like a farm hand. Well, better work, that's all. If we're picked up this time, it's curtains. Oh, uh, incidentally, you got a gun, haven't you? Yeah, sure. Let's see it. Uh-uh. No dice, Eddie. Red didn't tell me everything, just enough. So? So you'll get your money's worth. I'll do what I'm supposed to do and no questions asked, but my little automatic and I stick together regardless, real close, together. <laughs> okay, Marlo. Suit yourself. I will. And something else. The rest of the company is going along. Is that all set? Well, we'll see about that when the time comes. You're not leaving any loose ends around, are you? It's not your worry, pal. We'll get out of here around 11. Oh, and that routine about your car being stalled, it is a gag, I hope. Oh, sure, it won't start. If anybody tries, but in 10 seconds with a screwdriver, I can fix it. <laughs> You're okay, Marlowe. Just keep playing your game. Yeah, I will. Maybe then I'll find out what the score is after all. Huh? Mm, you might at that. Come on, let's eat. Dinner at the Brule Farm was as loaded with gay chatter as a bad case of lockjaw. And when it was over, the participants scattered like everybody else was contagious. I wound up alone in the dark spare room on the second floor, which had one advantage. Windows that viewed both the front and the rear. The moon was bright, so I didn't bother with the lamp. I listened to Dolly rattle dishes in the kitchen until that stopped, and then... I watched old man Brule pace his front yard. Once Ed Fry went out and talked to him briefly and then headed for the front door again. For a long hour after that, the big house was silent until from somewhere out in the back, there was a soft metallic tapping. Eventually, I spotted a heavy figure outside tossing pebbles against a window pane downstairs. And he edged back through the shadows to the barn. A moment later, I saw the girl slip out a rear door and run across the backyard and join her. I went down the back stairs and out along the house to a hedge and... I followed that until I was close enough it's to true, hear It's true, I tell you. He's an escaped convict, a killer. He's been hiding out here on your place. I can't believe it, no. I just can't. Are you sure? Of course I am. I read it by accident just tonight in an old newspaper from Denver. The whole story with pictures. There's no doubt about it. Ed Fry is really Eddie Fillmore. He's a murderer plenty of times over. What? Well, what do we do? Shall we call the police? Ah, uh, no. Not on your life. Listen. You want to get off this farm, don't you? More than anything in the world. Okay. Then we'll do it. Together, Dolly. I didn't tell another soul about this. You know why? Because I put out a reward. A big one for him. $2,500. And we're going to get it. Just us, you and me. But how, Noah? How can we possibly... What's that? Did you hear that, Noah? That's yeah, nothing, nothing. It's one of the cats, maybe. Look. You've been taking walks with him lately, Dolly. Well, yes, I have, Noah, but... Well, never mind that now. Just get him to take another one right away. Get him to walk you down to Pritchard's house. I'll be waiting there, and as soon as you get inside, I'll jump him. You'll never know what hit him. Will you do it? Pritchard's house? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll try. You, you give me some time to persuade him. Sure, sure. Oh, I knew you'd see things my way, honey. Oh, no. Oh, no. Boy, no. With, with that reward money, there'll be no stopping us. You better go in now before they miss you. Okay. 
I'll get him there just as soon as I can. Hey, Bickman. What? Who's there? Marlowe. Listen, I got to talk to you. You were here listening all the time, weren't you? Yeah, and believe me, you're making a mistake. You're playing with dynamite, Bickman. You two are nuts to tackle that guy alone. He's too tough for you. So you want to help so you can cut yourself in on the reward, that's all. Well, it ain't going to work. Don't be a sap. He's covered himself. There's somebody else in with him. Somebody around here, he's got an ally. You two try to grab him, and you're going to be in trouble. You're lying. He's been hiding out all alone, and we're going to get him, Dolly and me, by ourselves. And if you try to horn in, mister, so help me, I'll beat your brain. Cut it out. Reward or no reward, you got to listen to me. I got to nothing. No! Maybe that'll teach you not to stick your nose in, city boy. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Fred Allen's first appearance on the CBS Jack Benny Show. Al Jolson sings, but the face is Charlie McCarthy's. Andy of Amos and Andy goes on trial for deserting his bride by mistake. Those are three headlines that guarantee you a world of fun on CBS tomorrow night. Yes, this third Sunday of the new year will be an all-time high in radio entertainment. Hear them all on CBS tomorrow night. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Covered Bridge. I didn't pass out. But my jaw hurt and my legs moved like they were rubber. Now I had to find the roving Walter Brule because he should know where Pritchett's house was, where the ambitious team of Dolly and Noah might be biting off a lot more than they could chew, healthy 4 H teeth notwithstanding. Mr. Brule! Mr. Brule! Yeah? Hello? Who, who is it? Marlowe! Come here a minute, will you? It's important. Yeah, it's important. Now, what is it, Mr. Marlowe? But... Ah, it's your face! What's this? It's your friend Noah. We had a few words. Noah Bigman? He was no friend of mine. Yeah, he's no friend of mine either. Look, Brule, I... I'm going to have to trust you. I've got no choice. Bickman found out Ed Fry is really an undesirable named Eddie Fillmore is wanted for the police by murder. Murder? And he wants to trap him for a $2,500 reward that's been posted and didn't want me in the way. No. Now, look. I'm not a passing tourist with motor trouble, but a private detective. Tell me, who is Pritchard and where does he live? Pritchard? Where does he live? Uh, Mr. Marlowe, somebody has been making a joke on you. Elihu Pritchard died 20 years ago. He lived right in this house where I do today. This is Pritchard's house here? Oh, Pritchard's house? No, no, no. That is down the road near your car, the covered bridge. That is Pritchard's house. The bridge? Yeah, you see, Elihu Pritchard was from New England, and he had a covered bridge on his farm there, so he wanted one here. He built it himself day by day, a board here, a nail there. Oh, and, and since he spent so much time at it, people call the bridge his house, is that it? Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. But then, uh, why is it important? Because of a meeting, Mr. Brule, a get-together that I don't think is going to be on the quiet side. Let me borrow your flashlight, will you? Sure. Now get back inside and call the police. But what are you going to do? Reinforce the reward, happy sweethearts, and keep an eye out for someone I haven't met yet. A third party Eddie Fillmore plans to tour Mexico with. It was a quarter of a mile romp country style back down to the covered bridge. When I was there, the Mauser I'd recovered from George in one hand, flashlight in the other. I found only the moon washed, gray covered bridge itself, trying to stand erect like an old soldier who has more pride than posture. But then, as I stepped from the chalk road onto the sheltered oil soaked planking, I found something else. Inside and face down was Noah Bickman. And lying nearby, the red-stained, icy fingers of the pitchfork that had killed him. I started to move closer. But then footsteps from the road behind suggested that I do different, so I moved quickly back to the bridge entrance, flattened myself into a narrow shadow and waited. Noah? Noah, is that you? It's Marlowe, Dolly. What? Mr. Marlowe, what are you doing here? Why are you down at the bridge at this hour? Where 
Where's Nora? He's dead, Dolly. Huh? Was dead? He's in there, but don't go inside. Look, I tried to stop him, believe me. Stop him? Stop him Don't from what? bother, baby. I know about Fry being Fillmore, the reward, all of it. What? How? Well, first of all, I'm a private detective from L.A. was dragged into this by an ex-buddy of Fillmore's. Second, I was in the barn when you and Noah made your plans. Oh. When you left, I tried to talk Noah into accepting my help. Why? Because I know what Fillmore's kind is like. I mix with them every day. I know how they work. Look, did you tell Fillmore to meet you here, yes or no? No. No, I couldn't find him. I've been looking since I left the barn every place. That's why you came down here just now? Yes. I wanted to tell Noah that our plan would have to be postponed. But what difference does all this make? I don't know. Maybe a little, maybe a lot. If Fillmore had known about this, this rendezvous you two planned, it'd be 20 to 1 that he got here ahead of schedule and took care of Noah. Since he didn't. Yeah, since he didn't, I'm betting on a third party, someone we haven't met yet. A third party? Yeah, now listen to me and do just as I say. Turn around and walk straight back up to the house, and when you get there, get inside and stay put. But, Marlo, what is... Go on, fast! All right. But be careful, Marlo. Whoever killed Noah won't hesitate to kill you, too. When she started back up the road, I turned toward the bridge again. My flashlight following the dusty white footprints on the freshly oiled planking leading to the dead man. I stood over in the circle of light sweeping the area around him. There was just one thing I had to know. Marlo! Marlo! Uh, it's me, Walter Brewer. What are you doing down here? Well, I thought you might need help, so after I called the police, I got my rifle and came down here and I... Yeah, he's dead. The prongs on that fork went right through him. How terrible. Yeah. Look, Brule, was this planking freshly oiled today? Yeah, uh, why? I just wanted to make sure those chalk footprints were made today. But what do footprints... Brule, you stay here and see that no one has the bridge. But where are you going? Up to your house in a hurry, because I think I know who the killer and the third party is. city-bred legs and smog-fed lungs, I made it up to the house in record time. But as I reached for the front door, I knew that time hadn't been quite good enough. The shot had come from somewhere in the house, and by the time I reached the living room, I knew I was too late to do any good. In a chair at the far side of the room, Dolly was slouched down, a surprised expression on her face, while her hands tried to hold back a small stain of blood oozing through her blouse. Little, frightened words whispered out of her mouth. You shouldn't have Stand where you are, Marlo. She had it coming to her, the two-timing louse. Eddie. Eddie, I'm trying to tell you. You don't understand. I understand I... plenty, you no good little... Eddie. I was in the barn, heard the whole thing. You and that Bickman, planning a switch with me out. No. You're wrong, Eddie. Tell it, Mr. Fox. Tell it. Dolly didn't try to double-cross you, Eddie. She only pretended to so she could set Noah Bickman up and kill him. That's what she did. No, no you're a liar. It's true. That's what I tried to tell Eddie. I, I don't believe it. Is that true, Marlo? She didn't cross me. She was trying to help me. That's right, Fillmore. Bigman found out who you were, wanted the 2,500 bucks you were worth, dead or alive. Dolly had to play him along for your sake. I should have listened to her. I should have listened. How'd you know all this, Marlo? I found Dolly's footprints inside the covered bridge. Proof she'd been there before I found Bigman's body. Yeah. And you know who I was, so you put it all together. Well, you're holding the gun, kid. What's the next move? Doesn't matter much anymore. I could still lamb out of here for Mexico. Somehow I don't want to. Not without Dolly. Phone the police, Marlow. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs>
was several hours before the county police and Eddie Fillmore had gone. Walter Brule and I sat at the long wooden table watching the light from the fire dance across the hanging skillets and pans by the grate. And nobody said anything for a long time. I... I suppose hot apple pie at four in the morning seems odd to a man from the city. Not at all. Four in the morning is sometimes the middle of the day in the city. Yeah. Yeah. More coffee, Mr. Marlowe? Yeah, yeah, please. Thanks. You know, Dolly wasn't really a bad girl. It was just that sometimes she didn't think. And a woman who loves like that doesn't think, Mr. Brule. She just feels. Maybe in some way... It is my fault, the whole thing. No, no. It's nobody's fault, Mr. Brule. She was... She was trying to do the right thing for the guy she loved. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if your bed is still ready, if, if you care to stay. Oh, thanks. Sure, I'd like to. If, if you can find your own way up, I, I think I'll sit here just a minute longer. Sure. Good night. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. As I sat looking out over the starlit countryside, I thought of all the great love stories written about the good people who love, live, and suffer. And then the pathetic face of Dolly and the pain-racked face of Eddie said, what about us? And I had no answer. Yeah, chalk up another one, Marlowe. Another one of those things which there is no answer. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Ben Wright, Jack Moyles, Wilms Herbert, Jack Crucian, and Barney Phillips. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a twisted mind, a hole cut in a wire fence and a corpse in a storeroom, all added up to freedom, but only for the one who had it coming. The event you've been waiting for, Fred Allen's first visit to the CBS Jack Benny Show will take place tomorrow night. Yes, the most famous guest appearance in radio, the Fred Allen Jack Benny Act, will be heard in all of the CBS stations tomorrow night. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows over most of the same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.